This is Julie Hood, and this is um, Family Life Church Adult Bible Study, and I'm really glad you could join me today. Uh, I, we were off for about eight weeks. It was wonderful. It was our 50th anniversary, and um, we got to go up a little south of, of Monterey, and our hotel was right across the street from the ocean, and I loved it. And plus, we took time to go to uh, see my uncle. He's 90 years old, and I got to see my cousins, and they're all in a suburb of uh, Las Vegas called Summerlin. So we had a nice anniversary, and but it's always good to come home. I don't know if you feel that way, but there's just something about home that's nice. And so we're up and doing our Bible studies. Jim did uh, last week and today is me. Um, and, uh, but before I start, I like to pray. So if you don't have your, your Bible and your paper and your pencil, so you can take notes from the um, screen over here, then please go get it while I pray. Lord, it's such a privilege to be able to teach your people and I ask humbly, Lord, that you would help them to understand everything that I'm going to say and that you would instill it into their hearts and their minds. I pray, Lord, that you would make it a blessing to everyone who hears it. We love you. We thank you. And we ask for your help today in Jesus' name. Now. I'm going to be doing uh, the book of Jude. Um, people, I did the book of Jude when we were doing it live. And some of you who watch it were actually there. Many of you said they'd like to hear it again. There's so much information, you know. So I'm going to be doing it again. And for those who weren't with us live, I want you to understand that Jude and James were brothers. James uh, is the James from the book of James. He was uh, the leader of the Jerusalem church and Jude and James were brothers and they were half brothers to Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> let's get started. Now, I wanna ask you a question. What do these schools have in common? Harvard, Yale, Columbia, William and Mary, Dartmouth, Princeton. Now, if you tell me they're all college, I'd say, yes, you're right. Some of you may be saying uh, they're all universities. And again, yes, you're right. Some of you might even say they're Ivy League schools and most of them are. But what do they really have in common? So let me tell you. They were all founded and built for the propagation, which is for the promoting and spreading of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every one of them had a Bible foundation. Every one of them was founded for the preaching of the gospel and for training ministers and godly Christian laymen to spread the gospel across America. And you think about those schools now, and it's really sad because that isn't what they're about. And the same thing that has happened to these uh, schools has happened to many once great denominations. And what has happened to many once great denominations, sad to say, has happened to many churches. There has been an apostasy. The word apostasy means a falling away from the faith or a turning from the faith. And that is really what this little book of Jude is all about. It's a warning of the apostasy, the lapsing of the faith or the turning from the faith 
that is going to take place in the last days. And if you haven't noticed, we are living in the last days. Are your churches full? Are they, are people wanting to, to go uh, out of their way to Bible study and things like that anymore? Where at one time in America, Sunday, everything was closed except the churches. It's not that way anymore. What happened? Now we're going to read from the book of Jude. There's no chapters in Jude, just 25 verses. And if you're not sure where it's at, go to the very last book of the Bible. Uh, it's in the New Testament. The last book is called the book of the Revelation and kind of hang a left. And that very first book, just before the book of the Revelation is the book of Jude. And I want to read the first four verses. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the devil has tried two ways to destroy the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ as well as the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he tried persecution. That is, he tried to persecute the saints and to uh, put them in danger even of their own lives, let alone their property and stuff. But persecution has not worked out very well for, for the devil. Um, there's a saying that uh, goes, uh, that the missionaries say, and that is that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Not only did love grow where the blood fell, but churches grow where the blood falls. I mean, when we are willing to die for the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than stopping the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it simply impels the work of Christ to move forward. And so many times when the enemy comes to try and stamp out the fire, the, it only cause, uh, causes uh, the embers to scatter and new fires to start. So the devil backed off and he said, well, if I can't beat them, I guess I'm going to have to join them. And if I can't work from outside with persecution, I'll work on the inside with infiltration. And I will destroy the biblical base upon which those churches operate. And that's what he has done. And we see the key in verses 3 and 4 where Jude says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. So apparently Jude wanted to write another type of gospel or another book of, of maybe Romans. He wanted to write about our common salvation. He wanted to preach kind of a gospel message. And he was all set to do it. But the Holy Spirit said, uh, you can't do that. You can't preach that. You can't write that. You wanted to write about the common salvation, but you're going to have to write that we are to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Because here is the problem, and we see it in verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. 
Now, he's talking about apostates and how they get into the churches. The word crept in means they came in through a side door. Everybody else comes in through the front door. But these guys kind of slip in through a side door. It is also used for a person who slips into the water without making a ripple. Just, you know, they're really clever. They come in very clandestinely. They come in very quietly, very stealthy, kind of like a cat sneaking up on its prey. And they come inside like termites, destroying the foundation of a building. And they work. Now Jude said, I have written to you about this and that you should earnestly contend for the faith. What he, when he says faith, now he's not talking about the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by which uh, we are saved, but he's talking about the revealed body of truth, which we call the Bible. And the Bible says we are to earnestly contend for the faith. Let me tell you a little bit about the faith, about the Bible. First of all, I want to talk to you about the completeness of it. Now, he says that you are to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. But literally, it really says that was once for all delivered unto the saints. And some translations actually have it that way. That is, God gave it, and God finished it, and he's not going to add anything to it. For Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Jesus is talking, and he says, Not one jot, not one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. I'm going to read that again. I want you to get it. Not one jot, not one tittle shall be added to the law until all be fulfilled. This is God's word and it is complete. We don't need any more new revelation. Now listen to me. We live in a day and an age of character, charismatic excesses and a day of cultism where people are adding to the word of God and subtracting from the word of God. And I'm reminded of a man who stood up in church and he read the scriptures. He says, if there are no additions or corrections, the scriptures stand approved as read. Believe me, there are no additions or corrections. The scriptures stand approved as read. If it is new, I want you to hear me, if it is new, then it is not true. Did you hear me? If it's new, it's not true. Now, God may give you new insights into the truth. God may illumine, illumine the truth to you, but God's not going to give you or anybody else a new truth. The faith, faith was once for all delivered unto the saints. Look at verse 8, and he says, Likewise, those filthy dreamers. Who are the dreamers? What does the word dreamer mean? Are they the dream people that come into church and sit down and they look so reverent and they close their eyes and they're trying to make the pastor think that they're meditating on every word he says. But I know what kind of meditation they're doing. I mean, they ought to be saying, now I lay me down to sleep every time they sit down. That's not what he was talking about. That's not what he's talking about when he calls them dreamers. He's talking about people who have visions, people who have extra biblical revelations, things that they have dreamed up out of their head. The Bible is signed, sealed, and delivered. It is the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. 
It is complete, and not only is it complete, it is correct. You see, if you are a dreamer or a visionary, if you think you have some new revelation, you are going to be wrong because it's all uh, subjective. This is objective truth. It is being certain and it is being right because it's always right. You see, there is a difference in being certain and being right. Did you know that? Did you know you can be certain and be wrong? I heard a minister tell a story about being in New, uh, I think it was New Orleans when he was uh, in seminary. And he was, uh, he had been preaching to a rescue mis mission and he was getting ready to go back home. But somehow he got confused and although he thought he was going in the right direction, which would be away from the river, he kept coming back to the river. And he kept saying to himself, but I know I'm going in the right direction. Have you ever lost your sense of direction? I know I have, and I hate that, believe me. But he was so certain he was going in the right direction, but he kept ending back up at the river. So you know what he finally did? He finally started to go by the signs and then he got straight home. All he had to do was read the signs. Listen, sometimes you will be dead certain that you're right, but you're dead wrong. That is the reason the Bible is here. That is the reason we have the faith that is not only complete, but it is correct. The apostle Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration and he saw the Lord transfigured before him and he heard God speak from heaven. But then he says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, we have a more sure word of prophecy more sure than what you've seen, more sure than what you've heard, valid as it may be, more sure is the Word of God. It is complete, it is correct, and it is committed to you. Now, he said in verse 3 that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints, and it was committed to you. That means that you are a steward over this. I hear people say, ah, you don't have to defend the Bible. The Bible will defend itself. Well, I guess that sounds good. And I think years ago, I may have said that myself, shame on me. But Jude didn't say that. Jude said to contend for the faith. You stand up for the faith, speak up for the Bible. John. Calvin, who we uh, get the term Calvinism, said, a dog barks when his master is attacked. I'd be a coward if um, I heard the word of God being attacked and did not stand up for the Bible. Because many of us don't want to seem contentious. And because many of us don't want to enter into anything, I don't know, distasteful. So we're seeing the faith of our fathers eroding and disappearing. Let me tell you that apostasy is very real. Look at a couple of verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. The Apostle Paul is speaking of the end times, and he says that the end times cannot come, that the Antichrist cannot come. All of the things of the end time cannot come until the apostasy comes first. So let's read it, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. The falling away comes from a Greek word 
that we get our word apostasy from. The end times cannot come until the apostasy comes. Paul told Timothy the same thing, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy, itching ears. And again, the Apostle Paul warned in second, I mean, the Apostle Peter warned in second, uh, second Peter chapter two, verse one, for there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnal, damnal heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, that is the setting for this little book of Jude. Now, it is a very frightening book, and that's why Jude wants to give his people assurance. So what God does here in this little book of Jude and through Jude is just to give people, you know, God's people, a security blanket. He wants uh, he just wraps the, the book up in some verses that deal with security. The first verse and the last two verses deal with the security of the believer. That is, he just wraps it up in a blanket that I like to call a security blanket. Why is this? Because when you read the book of Jude, if you are not careful, you'll begin to wonder if anybody gets saved, even you. That's because Jude is so strong and this book is so powerful. When he speaks of the apostasy and the heresy and the falling away, you might get to be thinking that Oh, wow, maybe I might lose my salvation. Because Jude is, go um, is going to talk about some who were once saved and then they lost their salvation. And I believe that Jude wants to make it very, very clear that once you're a child of God, once you're born again, once you are born of the Spirit, once you have uh, truly become a partaker of the divine nature, you can never, ever again become a lost soul as long as you stay in Christ. Remember, I told you before that when someone is lost, they're not saved, it's like they're walking in a, a dark cave and they're walking deeper and deeper into the cave and into the darkness. But when they get saved, what happens? They completely turn around and they start walking towards the light. They may stumble because we all stumble, but we're still facing the light and we're still saved. But when you turn your back on the light, when you turn your back on the Lord Jesus and start going back into this darkness of sin, that's when you lose your salvation. Nothing can take you out of God's hands, but you can purposely take yourself out of God's hands by walking away from him and denying him. But as long as you stay in Christ, and continue to walk in the light of his word, then you are secure in Christ Jesus. Let's look at verse one. Jude, the servant of Jesus and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by, the, by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. There are three things that Jude says about us that tells us about the security of the believer. The very first is this, we are called. Now, in this sentence, it is, you know, the last word is called, but it was put last in the Greek 
language for emphasis. Now, in English, we put things first for emphasis. And so uh, some translations, and some of you would have maybe a more modern translation where the word called is first, is the first word. That is the English sense of what the Greek meant. That is the emphasis. It is the very first thing. And so what is the first reason for my security and your security? It's God's sovereign purpose. The word sovereign means the decree of a king. Um, it's a ruler where there is no rising up. God has a purpose. And that purpose is seen in that God called you. Now, this word call does not mean like I call my neighbor and say, hi, why don't you come over? Let's have a cup of coffee or something. No. This word called means an official summons. You see, your salvation did not begin with you. It began with God. If it began with you, you might lose it. But since it began with God, you can never lose it because the Bible says he is able to finish that which he began. And God called you. And if he had not called us, guess what? None of us would have been saved. We love him because he first loved us. Of course, that's 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. So I want us to think a little bit about the word called. It means something official. It reminds us of another verse right away, which is Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are what? Who are called according to his purpose. Now we're talking about God's sovereign purpose those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, and he's talking about God's son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. First of all, the Bible says here that God has foreknowledge. God knows the future as well as the past and the present. God has foreknowledge. And God knows things that will transpire as though they have already transpired. And so God is the great omniscient God. Now the Bible says that when God foreknows the one whom he has set his affection upon shall come to him, he predestines that person to be like the Lord Jesus. So God foreknows, then he also predestines. That is, it is determined ahead of time that you're going to be like the Lord Jesus, that you're going to be conformed to the image of the Lord. Now, when God foreknows and God predestines, then God calls and God sends the gospel to that person so they can hear it, so they can believe it, so they can receive it. And so God calls that person. Then the one that God calls, he justifies. Now, what does the word justify mean? It means to be made like the Lord Jesus Christ. And God make, makes you in his sight absolutely, totally righteous. Justified by the grace of God. Someone put it this way, just as if I had never sinned. That's justified. All right. Then those whom he justified, the Bible says, he has glorified. Not will 
glorified, but has glorified because God lives in eternity. So it's already done in God's eyes. So in God's mind, he sees you already glorified. You may be thinking that you don't understand all of this, and hopefully you don't because neither do I. And I'd really hate for you to be way ahead of me. That would make me feel bad. But I don't have to have uh, to understand this. As a matter of fact, to tell you the truth, I don't think I'd have any confidence in a God that I could totally, totally understand. I'm glad that there are some things about God that I don't understand. But on the other hand, there are some things that we do know, and I'll tell you what we do know, that which has been settled in eternity cannot be undone in time. Am I right? And that which has been decreed by heaven cannot be annulled by hell. God has called you, and those that God calls will come. Now, you could be thinking to yourself, well, that's really great for those who are called. But maybe I'm not called. Maybe I'm not one of them. What will I do, Julie, if, if I'm not one of those that are called? I have good news for you. If you want to come, you may come. Isn't that wonderful? I have some more good news for you. If you want to come, you may. I think you ought to praise the Lord. Let me give you it in a couple of verses so you understand. Look at uh, John chapter 6, verse 37, where Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come. Shall come to me. They are coming. That's one of the exciting things about teaching, and I'm sure the preachers think that's one of the wonderful things about preaching you know the gospel because they are coming and all the father giveth me shall come to me now listen to the second part of that same verse and him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out so anyone who wants to come may come and he will receive them i think that's awesome Anybody who wants to come can just get up and come because he will be received. The Bible says whosoever will can come. We are part of the whosoever. So we can all come. It's true. God has a sovereign purpose. But the reason I am so secure is that my salvation did not initiate with me. It initiated with God, and it is predestined that I'm going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. He foreknew me. He predestined me. He called me. He justified me. He glorified me already in his sight. And so our salvation, number one, is rooted as our security blanket is this, God's sovereign purpose. Second reason, not only God's sovereign purpose, but God's special people. Look again at verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God. Look at the word sanctified. Bible scholars tell us that's not really the best translation. It should rather, rather than sanctified, it should be beloved. And some translations actually have it that way. Perhaps yours does. It is the same word that begins in verse 3, beloved. It is the same word there that is translated beloved. Now, sanctified is good, but beloved is better in this particular instance because it tells something of the nature of God's people. Remember, God loves the lost, but his saved people are his beloved. You may ask, so hey, what's the difference? Well, let me tell you. I have a friend. She's probably 20 years younger, maybe a few more years younger. Her name is Georgina. 
and I love my friend. But my husband, Jim, he is my beloved. See, there's a difference, and I like the difference. Jim is my beloved because he is special to me. God loves the world, but when we get saved, we are made accepted in the beloved. And who's the beloved? It's the Lord Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so we are accepted in him, and that's why God sees us as God sees him. And God's name for his own dear children is that we are his special people. And we are beloved. Now, this word beloved is what we call a perfect participle. Oh, what does that mean? What it means is the finished action in the past has a result on the present. It is something that cannot be changed. It is fixed, it's settled. Because it is settled in the past, it affects us right now. We are God's beloved. Every now and then I'll say something I think is profound, probably not, but I think it is. And I'm about to do it. And I want to warn you, I want to warn you or ask you to please pay attention. You, you are a child of God. Then there is nothing you can do that will make God love you more. I'm going to tell you something else. There's nothing you can do that will make God love you less. Isn't that a fantastic thought? Nothing you can do to make him love you more. Nothing you can do that will make him love you less because God cannot love you any more than he already loves you. And he will not love you any less. He doesn't love us because we're valuable. We are valuable because he loves us. He doesn't change us so he can love us. He loves us so he can change us. He loves us. Please hear me. He just loves us. We are his beloved. How much does he love us? Look at John chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Jesus Christ is praying his high priestly prayer, and he says to the Father, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that is, to his beloved. And they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that thou may be made perfect in one, in one, and that the world may know. Now listen to this. This is the really key part. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Did you hear that? How does God love you? As he loved Jesus. The same way thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. God loves you as he loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, personally, I think that's too much to take in. But I, it, it's, it's amazing. That's the reason the Apostle Paul, or excuse me, the Apostle John, uh, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, he got to thinking about this kind of love. And he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Do you know why he said, behold, what manner of love? Personally, I think he was fishing for an adjective to describe that love, and he couldn't find one. I can see him trying to speak to himself, and he's going, behold, what super love? Uh-uh. Okay, what fantastic love? No, that doesn't, that's not right. What colossal love? No. What spectacular love. What love? He couldn't find a word. I heard of an Indian who was sending a love message to his girlfriend by smoke signals. He had been sending up little puffs of smoke 
uh, trying to tell her how much he loved her. Now, he was out in the desert uh, when they were testing atomic bombs. And about that time, he looked off in the horizon and he saw a tremendous mushroom cloud. And he thought, boy, I wish I had said that. That's the way John was. He was sending up little smoke signals and there's this atomic bomb kind of love. And he doesn't even know how to express it, so he simply says, behold, what manner of love. That word manner of love literally means what uh, kind of unearthly love, love from another place. What otherworldly love is this? What kind of non-human love is this? Behold, what manner of love that we should be called the sons of God. You want me to tell you another reason Jude says that we are secure, that we are in the beloved, because God feels about us the same as he feels about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that brings me to a wonderful verse, and it's Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. And I do hope that you're all listening to my husband teach on Romans because he's fantastic. Everybody's loving it. But anyway, Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, I want you to hear it. Paul's talking and he says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He didn't leave anything out, did he? He mentioned 10 strong enemies, death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, or any other creature. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing you can do to make him love you more, nothing you can do to make him love you less. You are in the beloved and God loves you as he loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And in my mind, that's a pretty good security blanket. Now, first of all, we talked about God's sovereign power. You are called, I mean, his so sovereign purpose, you are called. Secondly, we've talked about God's special people. You are beloved. And then thirdly, I want you to think about God's strong power. You are preserved. Look here in Jude verse 1, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Now look at that little word in. That word most likely means preserved by. Jesus Christ. Any way you put it, in Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. All are tremendous truths. The whole idea is that Jesus Christ is doing the preserving. He is a strong power. Remember, you're no, you're no safer than the one who is keeping you. This word preserved literally means kept. Kept, and it has the idea not of a guard, uh, keeping a prisoner, but it has the idea of a mother who is watching over her new little baby with tender, loving care. Now, if you're a baby and your mother is taking care of you, where's the source of your security? In you or in the one who is taking care of you? You see, your security is no better than the one who is making you secure. I hope you understand that. Now, if you're kept by Jesus Christ, do you think you're secure? Do you think uh, he's going to lose you? Huh. That's the reason Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 28 through 30, and I give unto them, and he's talking about his beloved, and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Did you hear that? Out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You're in better hands than Allstate. You're in God's hands. 
It is not that you keep your salvation. It is he keeps you. You are preserved by Jesus Christ. And to feel insecure is really to doubt God. So let me give you some other scriptures. Second Timothy chapter four, verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Who delivers us? The Lord. Who preserves us? The Lord. Second Timothy chapter one, verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. Not I am persuaded that I will hold out until the end. I know whom I have believed. Not I know in whom. I know whom. Paul didn't know about Jesus. He knew Jesus. I know whom I believe and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. The Lord Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 15, and the Father, you know, to the Father concerning us, he said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. Did Jesus ever pray out of the will of God? Of course not. Did he ever pray a prayer that wasn't answered? Of course not. He said in John 11 and verse 42, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. And Jesus prayed, Father, keep them. And that prayer is an answered prayer. So look how Jude brings the blanket around to the tail end of the book. The first part of the book um, is one side of the blanket. Now, the tail end of the book, look how he sums it up in verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Do you see that? Are you looking at it? Who keeps you from falling? Who does? Who keeps you from falling? You? No. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Listen, when you put the t these two truths together that we've already learned, you're going to see something I think is tremendous. On one hand is God's fathomless love. He loves us as he loves the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in the beloved. And on the other side is God's unlimited power. He has glory, majesty, dominion, and power. Now, when you put that love and that power together, do you see why we're secure? Now, I will do anything, uh, to pr I, the, anything I can do to protect my children, but I'm only human. I will do anything I can do to keep one of my children from perishing. But again, I'm only human. But God has a love that makes my love for my children pale into insignificance. He has that kind of love for you. And God has tremendous power. He is able to keep you from falling. Now, those who <clears throat> believe once saved, always saved, may feel that they can get saved and then sin all they want to. Now, I sin all I want to, even more than I want to, but I don't want to. And I believe if you still want to sin, then you've never really been saved and you never and you yourself need to be born again i want you to see this man who wrote this book his name was jude and he describes himself as jude the servant of the lord jesus christ in verse one a servant 
And the word servant that he used is the Greek word doulos, which means bond slave. We translated him a little nicer and we say a servant of Lord Jesus Christ, but what it really means is a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about a bond slave. A bond slave had no personal possessions and had no personal rights. I mean, if, this ma if his master wanted him to, he had to die for his master. He was a man under orders. Now, Jude was that kind of a man. Jude believed in God's security, but it did not make him a rebel. It made him a bond slave of Jesus Christ. This kind of security doesn't make you want to sin. It is a great, great, great emphasis to holiness. Now pay attention to this. The same God who saves you is the same God who will keep you. What a security blanket we have in him. But remember, we must always, always stay in Christ because that's the key. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this lesson that you've given me. I pray that it was a blessing to those who hear it and that they will remember what I said so that they will never doubt their walk with you. They need to hold on to it. They need to know that you're not going to drop them. You know, a mother could drop their baby, but you will never drop us. That's just not the way you do things. You will keep us and preserve us and help us even as we walk in the light of your word so that we can follow you and become more and more like you every day. Now please bless everyone who has watched this video and help them to know that they are secure in Christ. I love you. And I give you praise, glory, and honor for everything, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, that's the end of this lesson. And um, I hope you'll be back next week to, to hear more on Romans from my husband. He's just doing a fantastic job. And then the following week, we'll go into some more of Jude. But until then, um, we love you. Bye. Thanks for watching our Family Life Church YouTube channel. Share this video with a friend and subscribe to our page so you never miss a blessing.